Occupational English Test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one. Questions one to twelve. You will hear a physiotherapist talking to Kelly, a woman with lower back pain. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. All right. Hi there, Kelly. My name is Erica, and I'm one of the physiotherapists here. Hi, Erica. How can I help you today? Um, I've been getting a pain in my lower back on the left side, um, around my hip and through the bum cheek area, um, when I'm running, especially. Hmm. Okay, that's not sounding terribly comfortable at all. Um, how long has this been going on for? It's something I've had on and off for years, and it started off as just a kind of dull pain. Um, a bit of an ache, and now it's it really feels like it's spasming or something. It hurts even when I put weight on my left leg. Um, usually I, I feel it start, and if I kind of lie on a tennis ball and massage through the muscle, it goes away. Mm -hmm. But lately it's just been getting worse, and I can feel it sort of tight through my whole hip area. Um, and I can feel it kind of even when I'm sitting and, and sleeping or at, at night when I'm trying to sleep. If I roll, I can feel it kind of... It's hard to explain. It's like a shooting pain that travels down my leg. Okay, so you described the pain initially as a dull pain yeah. and also an aching sort of a sensation. Yep. Is the shooting pain different to that? Yep. Okay, so the shooting pain, where does that go? It's, it starts in the same place and it goes like down the back of my leg, kind of through the back of my knee and sometimes down to my ankle area. Okay, no worries at all. And that would be the shooting pain only? That's not an aching sensation? No, it's just like, it feels like a twinge travelling mm -hmm. down. All right, so just coming back to our body chart for a second. So we've talked about two distinct pains, I think. There's that dull aching pain sort of around the bum and the lower back and the hip area there. Then there's that shooting pain or twinging pain that you get that goes right down the back of the left leg down to the calf. Yep. With the twinging pain, do you have to have the dull pain in your bum? before you get the twinging pain? Yep. You have to have that pain yep. first. Okay. Can you ever get the twinging pain by itself? No. No. Okay. Can you get the dull pain by itself? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you have to have one to get two. Yeah, I don't always get the twinging pain. That's usually when it's feeling worse. Okay. It gets really tight. Okay, no worries at all. Um, now, just to confirm and clear some other areas, there's no current problems with your left knee? Nope. Beautiful. Um, and currently the front of the left hip is fine? Yeah, it feels quite tight through there, but it's not painful. Mm -hmm. So tightness? Yep. No worries at all. Any pains in the right hip? No. Nope. No, the right knee? No, the right side's fine. Completely fine. Yeah. Good. No pains at all down there? No. Nope. Any pins and needles or numbness anywhere? Nope. No. Good.
Extract 2, Questions 13 to 24. You will hear a local GP talking to a patient called Paul Jung. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Ah, good morning, Paul. How are you doing today? Oh, hello, Doctor. Well, I see that you've just had heart surgery for a repair of an aortic aneurysm and now have a mechanical heart valve in place. Yes, my surgeon advised me that I set up contact with a local GP for follow-up care, so uh, here I am. Yes, your thoracic surgeon, Dr. Goodhands, has forwarded me your case history, but it appears you've made a very good recovery. Well, I hope so. Now, before we talk more about managing your recovery, I'd like to get a few personal details from you, if you don't mind. Okay. So, how old are you? 32. And where are you from? I'm from China. Okay. And are you married? No, I'm single. And where are you living now? A uh, house or apartment? I'm um, sharing a house with some other students. Okay. Um, and what are you studying? I'm doing a PhD in um, IT. So you're quite busy here in Australia. Yeah, that's right. And how is your study going? Uh, okay, I'm enjoying it, but it's pretty intense. So a bit of a stress involved with your study? Yes. I see. Now a bit of information about your medical history. Okay. Do you suffer from any allergies? No. Any past surgical history? I had my tonsils removed as a boy. And uh, apart from that? No. How about your blood pressure? That's been high since 2009. Uh, is there any family history of illness? Uh, well, my father died of a stroke when he was 45. I see. Mm. Uh, do you drink? Not much. Sometimes on the weekends. Uh, what about smoking? Uh, not now, but I used to smoke about 10 to 15 cigarettes a day. And what's your current weight? Uh, 95 kgs. And your height? Uh, I think I'm about 178 centimetres. When was your operation exactly? Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the 2nd of September actually. Okay, let me check your blood pressure. Good news, it's 110 over 70. Oh, good. Pretty soon we'll be able to start weaning you off some of the blood pressure lowering medication. Well, that'll be good. And how is your diet at the moment? Are you being careful with what you eat? Yes, uh, I've managed to reduce salt in my diet and I'm trying to lose some weight. Good. And are you doing any exercise? No, I'm afraid to do anything too much at the moment. Okay, I understand. But you could now start with some gentle walking or other forms of mild exercise. Just be sure you don't lift heavy weights. Right. And there is a very good cardiac exercise program that I advise you to join. It's run by the Cardiac Rehabilitation Unit at the Spirit Hospital. So I'd recommend you contact them. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, 
you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. All right, so real quick, uh, Mrs. Craig is a 65-year-old female. She's one day post-op from a total abdominal hysterectomy. Uh, no known diagnosed allergies. Uh, vital signs have been stable today, um, although we've had some pain control issues. Um, 0.5 milligrams at the lauded, Q2 hours. Um, last one was at 6.30, next one will be at 8.30. Okay. Uh, liquid diet, orders to progress to a regular diet as tolerated. Uh, as well as starting oral meds as soon as she can tolerate a regular diet. Um, Has she, she been eating? Uh, not that I've seen today, <sighs> no. Uh, uh, she does have IV, normal saline running, uh, 50 milliliters per hour. Okay. SCDs are applied as okay. per policy. Uh, she has a Foley catheter. Um, I believe that's about it. Do you have any questions? Okay. Question 26. Now read the question. Bedside shift report is so important, not only to our patients, but to our staff. It creates a transparency of communication that is shared between the two caregivers in front of the patient and engaging with the patient and family if the patient requests. This allows for the patient to hear the information that is being shared and ask questions when those occur. It also allows us not only to confirm the goals that we have for the patient, for their healing and their recovery, but it allows us to engage with our patients and ask, what's the most important thing for you? What can I do for you today to make your day better? Question 27. Now read the question. You indicated that it was at a seven and you're not due to have more pain medication until 8.30. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back once I'm done greeting all my patients and I'm gonna check to see if there's anything the doctor has ordered for you that we might be able to give you in addition to the Dilata that you're already receiving. Many times uh, physicians will order different kinds of pain medications that patients can take concurrently. Uh, I'm glad that you're splinting using the pillow um, to press down when you're coughing or sneezing. That also helps with pain control. Now another non-pharmaceutical way to um, control pain, help alleviate it, is actually activity. It might seem counterintuitive, but making sure that your body is moving and that you're using your muscles actively helps control the pain. So if possible, I'd like to get you up uh, this evening. Maybe if nothing else, just walk to the bathroom or maybe walk to the door and then back again. I think that might help. Question 28. Now read the question. In a perfect world, we'd rather that our patients not have to use the call light or even call us on our telephone. And one of the ways that we endeavor to do that is through hourly rounding when either myself, a nurse, 
or a patient care tech will check on the patients. Perfect. So when you press that red button, it rings at the unit desk and someone will come on the line and ask what you might need. Is that something like something you can do? I can do that. Terrific. So what I'm gonna do next is update my name and number there on the board, all right? A patient always feels better the more information they have. And we strive to do that, for example, with our communication board. We actively update the communication board and point to it as a way for them to call us whenever they need help with something or have a question that needs to be answered. Question 29. Now read the question. We utilize the hourly rounding and bedside shift report not only to enhance the patient experience by creating a safe environment um, and a healing environment for them, but it creates trust in the care team that is caring for the patient. Our eye care values integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and excellence are mirrored in these efforts as we create an exceptional care experience for every patient and family member, I might add, every day with a spirit of warmth, friendliness, and personal pride. Question 30. Now read the question. Uh, we set a comfort goal for three. What's your pain level at right now, Mrs. Craig? On a scale of zero to ten, how do you feel? About a seven. About a seven? Okay. Um, she's on a liquid diet. Uh, is she taking anything for the pain? She is. Uh, she has ordered 0 0.5 milligrams of Dilaudid IV as needed every two hours. And she did receive that about 6.30. I updated the board, so the next one due, Mrs. Craig, would be about 8.30 this evening. Uh, she's also been using splinting, which has helped with the abdominal pain. Um, she's on a clear liquid diet uh, with orders to progress to a regular diet as tolerated. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
And today I'm going to be giving you a broad overview about the incidence of congenital heart disease uh, in Australian newborns. Certainly we know that if the mother has congenital heart disease, then her children are more likely to have congenital heart disease. We know that the older a mother gets, that this places her at risk of having a baby who has congenital heart disease. We know that if mum has diabetes early in pregnancy, and particularly um, uncontrolled diabetes very early on in pregnancy, that this places the baby at risk of having congenital heart disease. In pregnancy, we screen women for rubella, for cytomegalovirus, for herpes simplex virus and for Coxsackie B virus because we know that these viral infections are all associated with congenital heart disease. So you would think that um, we probably diagnose congenital heart disease quite well antenatally and we certainly know that for instance in Queensland in the most recent statistics uh, that 99.7% of pregnant women have an obstetric ultrasound. If we compare this to Victoria, we know that in Victoria around 95% of women have an antenatal ultrasound at 18 weeks. What might come as a surprise to people is that despite uh, our excellent techniques in ultrasonography, that in fact only around 53% of quite significant congenital heart disease is detected. And to put this into um, perspective for you, if we look at the number of babies that the Newborn Emergency Transport Service tra uh, retrieve every year with congenital heart disease, we know that around 20% of the babies that we retrieve will be born in a level one hospital. It has very limited diagnostic facilities, so may or may not be able to do uh, a blood gas, uh, usually cannot do a cardiac echo postnatally, um, and therefore uh, in these places the, um, the staff have very limited facilities to deal with a baby who's born who can be really quite ill. Around a quarter of the babies that NETS retrieve will be born in a level two hospital, but these hospitals again are unable to maintain a baby who needs full life support or who needs intubation and ventilation. So these babies have to be retrieved. So we see that on average around 45% of babies who are born with very significant congenital heart disease are born outside of a tertiary centre. One of the questions we get asked quite often is that why don't these problems present in utero? Why is it that the baby grows quite normally, uh, is a good size, the mother gets to term, goes into spontaneous preterm labour, and it's only after the baby's born that we start to see problems? We certainly know that this is uh, because of fetal circulation. So during fetal life, the placenta is doing the work of oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal, and the baby really contributes very, very little to its day-to-day -day survival, probably only about 8%, because the placenta is oxygenating the blood and therefore the lungs are not acting as an organ of oxygenation. Now, of course, when the baby's born, the baby has to undergo very dramatic physiological and biochemical changes to shift from fetal circulation to an adult type of circulation. And therefore, if the baby has congenital heart disease, this is the time period that we're going to suddenly see it. Now, contrary to uh, what people have traditionally thought, the ductus arteriosus uh, does not necessarily close with the first breaths of life. And in fact, we know from ultrasound studies that only about 20% of babies' ducts are closed by 24 hours of age, around 82% by 48 hours, and in some babies uh, it takes up to three days for the ductus arteriosus to close completely. And this becomes important when we are thinking about the baby who has congenital heart disease because uh, the timing of the closure of the duct can affect the timing of presentation of the baby uh, to us. So we would expect that by three days of age that most babies' ducts will close. So what happens if the baby has congenital heart disease? How are we going to know it and when are we going to see these babies present with it? Well basically it all depends upon what the defect uh, affects. So if the defect uh, obstructs normal circulation, then we're going to see symptoms very, very early in the newborn period, basically in the period between the time the baby's born and the time that the ductus arteriosus closes. So conditions like transposition of the great arteries will present very, very early within the few, first few hours of the baby being born. As opposed to some of the other conditions which uh, appear as anatomical changes occur, such as the duct closing um, after three days of age, so this would be um, conditions such as coarctation of the aorta. And this can typically present around day seven or day um, up to day 10 of life, and typically after the baby has in fact gone home. So this might be picked up by the parents who notice that the baby is mottled 
He's uh, feeding poorly, um, seems cool to touch peripherally, um, is very, very tired and lethargic between feeds and seems to be breathing up uh, quite markedly. So how are we going to make a definitive diagnosis of congenital heart disease, and especially out in a small hospital or a, a GP surgery where they may not have um, gold standard tools? We certainly know that the gold standard for diagnosing congenital heart disease is echo by a paediatric cardiologist after birth, but these facilities are really only available at the major tertiary teaching hospitals such as the Royal Children's. And so until a cardiac echo can be performed, we really have to rely on our clinical signs to try and differentiate congenital heart disease from some of the other causes of cyanosis and collapse in the newborn period. And this can be really quite challenging. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Aboriginal health issues, diabetes. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians have the fourth highest rate of type 2 diabetes, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or NIDDM in the world. Estimates vary, but it is thought that between 10 and 30 percent of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have type 2 diabetes. This rate is about two to four times higher than the rate for non-Indigenous Australians. The incidence of gestational diabetes, diabetes in pregnancy, is also two to three times higher among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women than in the general Australian population. Kidney failure is a serious complication. Unmanaged diabetes can result in kidney failure because high blood sugar levels damage the millions of tiny filtering units in each kidney. Aboriginal people are only 2% of the Australian population, but they account for around 9% of all new patients with kidney failure, end-stage renal disease, ESRD. Diabetes is an important part of increased ESRD in Aborigines. A person with ESRD has no kidney function at all and must rely on dialysis or have a kidney transplant operation. Other complications of diabetes include retinopathy, which can cause blindness, neuropathy, which can cause leg ulcers and lead to amputation, coronary artery disease, diabetes is an important risk factor. A range of causes. 
The high rate of diabetes among Aboriginal Australians is thought to be caused by a number of factors working in combination, including genetic susceptibility, diet, obesity, lack of physical activity, gestational diabetes, low birth weight, poor standard of living, reduced access to medical care. Genetic susceptibility. Some researchers suggest that Aboriginal people have a thrifty genotype, which helped to support their traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle. This means their bodies are genetically programmed for glucose intolerance and high blood cholesterol levels so that body weight can be maintained during lean times. However, the Western diet, readily available to modern Aboriginal people, makes obesity, diabetes and cardiovascular disease more likely. Dietary changes. The tendency for the modern Aboriginal diet to be high in fats and sugars but low in carbohydrates, fibre and nutritional value is a major cause of diabetes. In many cases, limited access to a range of fresh, wholesome foods means that many Aboriginal children are undernourished. It is thought that inadequate nutrition during childhood may increase a person's risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. Obesity and abdominal body fat. An obese person is 10 times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than a person of normal weight. Around 6 out of 10 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are either overweight or obese. Body fat stored around the abdomen rather than the hips and thighs is a substantial risk factor, and around 75% of Aboriginal women carry too much body fat around their abdomen. Type 2 diabetes is more common in Aboriginal women than Aboriginal men. Lack of physical activity. Traditionally, Aboriginal people led physically active lives. With the adoption of Western diets, there is no longer any need to hunt for wild animals and gather uncultivated plants. A sedentary lifestyle is a known risk factor for obesity and the development of type 2 diabetes. Gestational diabetes. In some women, pregnancy hormones increase the body's resistance to using insulin. This causes gestational diabetes, a temporary form of diabetes that tends to resolve without treatment after childbirth. However, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes in later life is increased. The incidence of gestational diabetes is two to three times higher among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women than in the general Australian population. Low birth weight. Some studies indicate that low birth weight is associated with an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life, regardless of any other risk factors. The reason for this is not understood and it remains controversial. An Aboriginal woman is twice as likely, 12.4%, to have a low birth weight baby than a non-Aboriginal woman, 6.2%. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.